Hi folks, welcome back to module 2 of uh, the DC Institute and in this module we'll look at uh, who rules America. So this is uh, examination of the power dynamics in uh, Washington DC and the US in general and we'll take an empirical approach meaning try to understand uh, the power elite in a manner that can be studied, right? Manner that is instead of just theorizing uh, this book uh, or this module is based on a book by Dom Hoff, or G. William Dom Hoff, by this same name, uh, which was written in the 1960s and uh, is considered a classic in the study of the soci sociology of power. So trying to understand how elite groups uh, manage their power in the U.S. and what are the limitations of this theory. So that's basically what we'll try and do here. And uh, I want you to think about this from uh, a sociology perspective, meaning looking at it from a social dynamics perspective and to see uh, how much of this makes sense to you, right? You may not agree with all the arguments that Domhoff makes. Uh, you may, may agree with some of it, uh, but I want you to think as a scholar, I want you to think about how can we study power, right? So the multiple ways of studying power. And when you read this book, you realize uh, there are certain aspects which are very easy to do, some of which are not so transparent, so it's it's rather difficult. But before we start, uh, I want you to understand that in the US, uh, there is no agreed upon uh, understanding that there are social classes in the US, right? So Americans like to think that we are all equal. So that's the basis of American uh, Republic in some ways, right? So that it's a departure from the aristocratic way of Europeans. So as most of you would know, uh, or should know rather, that those who fled Europe and came to the US to establish the United States were fleeing many of those aristocratic ways of thinking, right? So they were fleeing uh, kings and queens, they were fleeing oppressive religious ideologies, and they saw America as a land of freedom. So that's hence, they wanted to make uh, America equal for everybody. Of course, there was slavery, of course, there was uh, other aspects of inequality, but among the free and landed people who were here, uh, they had a sense that, okay, we, we are all equal. And of course, after emancipation, after civil rights movement, there's a greater sense that uh, more and more equality exists in the US. So that's one uh, important aspect uh, you know, of understanding American society that I wanted to keep in mind. Though there are uh, you know, aristocratic families, you could think of the Kennedys, the Koch, Koch family and others, uh, but it's not as prevalent as in Europe. There are also others, uh, scholars like Michael Mann who proposed uh, what, what he calls a four network theory of power. Uh, so we, in which he argues that uh, power structures are based on four independent but intertwining, in four independent but intertwining networks ideological, economic, power, and political, right? IEMP model. Uh, so that's one way of thinking about uh, power. You know, how do these four aspects come together, right? Can the military and ideological overlap? Can the ideological and economic overlap? Or can all four overlap? And a lot of scholars who studied, say, uh, the Bush presidency uh, have argued that there was a strong uh, in military industrial complex, right? Which, which uh, pushed for an ideological view of the world, of America uh, being the lot of freedom, so democracy promotion and things of that nature that happened during Bush's era. And every president's time, there has been a mixing of these four areas of power. Uh, back to Domhoff. Domhoff proposes similarly uh, his four power network processes, right? Uh, that he think he argues are crucial to understanding American society. Uh, first is special interest process. So special interest is any small group of people who want to push for a particular uh, ideology, particular way of thinking, or particular way of living, right? It could be businesses, could be wealthy families, or it could be even nonprofits, for example. Then there is a the policy planning processes. So these are uh, what, what would be considered, uh, you know, networks uh, of think tanks, organizations, foundations, etc. Then there is a candidate selection process, meaning those groups or uh, you know uh, organizations that push for selecting a particular political candidate, right, for say for Congress or for presidency or what have you. And finally, there's the opinion shaping process, where 
uh, certain police uh, you know, policy decisions and ideas are shaped through the public process. So power is sort of shaped in these four different ways, right, uh, in American society. There could be a fifth way. You can always propose the fifth particular way, but these are four broadly uh, available ways of analysis of how power is shaped uh, through networks and processes in the U.S. And uh, Domov also argues that there are other ways of looking at power rather than just the ones outlined here. Uh, and those three are here, right, in terms of pluralism. So uh, there are other scholars, sociologists who argue that, yes, of course, these uh, perspectives are valid. However, power is far more uniformly distributed in American society. It's not just concentrated in these processes. Uh, for instance, you could they argue that labor unions have more power. Uh, even individuals have a lot of power through voting mechanisms and others, right? So that's the perspective of pluralism, that power, power is uniformly, dis not uniformly, but evenly distributed across various segments of society. Then there is a the state autonomy theory, meaning that ultimate power rests with the state, state or the government, right? Uh, and that's the Western model of uh, statehood, where ultimate uh, monopoly of violence is in the hands of the state, right? For instance, ability to imprison someone or even to kill someone is legitimate only in the hands of government, not individuals or other groups. And the third perspective is elite theory, where societies are supposed to be dominated by elite leaders. So these are other varying uh, sort of perspectives of power in the US. And finally, I want you all to think about when you read this book, and I encourage you to actually get a copy of the book uh, and read it, uh, is to think about how you study uh, power, power groups. And one of the methods that they have used, uh, Domhoff has used in his book, is through membership network analysis, membership in social clubs, university networks, alumni associations, and things of that kind, where uh, these uh, demonstrate, for instance, if you are a member of Harvard University Alumni Club, it gives you certain access that other alumni networks do not give you access to. If you're a member of a certain uh, business network or a board member of a certain uh, you know, enterprise, uh, it gives you certain access that others do not give you access to. So the social bonds that are formed in, through these institutions and uh, combining with the economic interests of these people uh, give you a certain leverage to overcome uh, certain challenges or policy disagreements, as he points out, uh, when it comes to uh, you know challenges in life, right? So that's both at an individual level as well as a group level, as a class level, uh, power plays out in these particular ways. And membership or belonging to these particular groups is a very, a very easy way to study how power manifests itself. Not to say that everybody in these groups thinks the same or not everybody has the same interests, but a large part of their interests align when you are part of such networks and your ability to exercise influence increases is his argument. So I'll leave you with this. I hope you uh, read the book. I hope you enjoy the other videos and other readings in this uh, module. And I look forward to discussing this uh, with you all soon. Thank you.